Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You're listening to the Awesomers.com podcast episode series, and this is episode number 54. And as always, all you have to do is go on over to awesomers.com slash 54 to find the relevant show notes, details, and the links that we talk about throughout today's episode. And by the way, don't hesitate to leave us a comment on that page, or why not leave a review while you're uh, online and uh, go to iTunes or Google Play or wherever your favorite place is. Leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. We're trying our best, uh, but we're 54 episodes into this baby, and we're dropping them daily, so we hope we're doing something that you find to be of value. Now, today, my special guest, you're going to love it. His name is Tim Francis, and he has done a number of things in his time, and we're going to talk about that in today's episode. But one of the things is he's the founder of Great Assistant, which helps entrepreneurs get Wait for it, a great assistant. Uh, what a what a clever and descriptive term, right? Now, for five years, he failed again and again with trying to hire assistants, and he kind of talks about some of that journey with us today. Three years ago, he finally cracked the code, and his current assistant, Sarah, now handles 95% of his inbox and has allowed Tim to focus on bigger opportunities. Tim has since appeared on Inc.com and is a regular contributor to Forbes, and he's even been a guest lecturer at NYU in New York. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy about Tim's approach to things is, you know, not only is he a, a systems guy, but he's a he's a human guy, right? He's, he focuses on kind of the human interaction. And some of the things that, that I'm aware of, that because Tim spoke at the Catalyst 88 Mastermind recently, and he went into detail about you know, some of the, the methodologies he used, I really love that it goes beyond just, you know, kind of putting ads out there, getting ads, filtering them down, you know, uh, it's it's far beyond that. And I, I think that is something that entrepreneurs not only can learn from, they can benefit from if they don't want to do uh, the time investment themselves. So I'm really excited that you're here. I know that you're going to be glad you joined us today. Welcome back, Gossamers. It's Steve Simonson, and here I am back again with another episode. And today I have a very special guest with me, Tim Francis. How are you, Tim? Wonderful. Great to see you. Uh, I have to ask the million-dollar question because this is my custom to mispronounce people's names. How did I do on your name? You know, Tim Francis sounded well executed to me. Whew, man. I tell you, I do need a, a base hit from time to time because I've been striking out a lot. So uh, that's welcome news to me and perhaps my listeners as well. So thank you for that. Um, so, Tim, I've already read in your bio, kind of given everybody a little um, understanding from the high level of, of some of your accomplishments, which are uh, robust and, and wide ranging indeed. But maybe you could just tell us kind of what you do day to day and where you're located uh, right now as we speak. So I'm a diehard Canadian, of course, and uh, I've become Canada's ambassador to Texas. I'm based mostly here in Austin. I've got an apartment right downtown overlooking the water. It's a spectacular place. I love hosting dinner parties, Steve, and a couple of Catalyst 88 members happened to be in town. Just last week, we had them up for the dinner party, uh, 15th floor overlooking the, the lake of uh, just outside downtown Austin. It was, it's absolutely spectacular. So if anybody wants to come to a dinner party, uh, just hit us up and we'll see if we can slip you into one of our guest lists. Boy, that's the place to be. There's the social insider list right there. So the beautiful Austin. And then how about taking your time day to day? Well, I know you have a number of initiatives, but where, where do you focus most right now? Right now, I'm focused very much on the executive level work in the business. So taking a look at financials, um, building my team, 
and other like what's going on with our customers. I spend a fair bit of time speaking to each one of our customers, um, seeing as we don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, customers like an e-commerce store. Thankfully, I do have an opportunity uh, to talk one-on-one -on -one with pretty much every one of our customers. So developing the team and feeding back the customer information to our team is really important to me so that our team is empowered to make decisions on my behalf. They can act autonomously. They don't have to stop every five minutes and ask for help. Um, I think that's really important, that DNA transfer um, to establish the culture of the team and to transfer that as well. And then also to, to be looking down the path to say what's coming down the road every 90 days for this team, including financially. How do I make sure that we've got all the money we need set aside for all the different projects, including bringing on new team members and whatnot? Yeah, that makes so much sense. I think it's a really important note for customers out there to understand kind of the, the difference, the fine line, if you will, between abdication and delegation, right? We're excited when we hire somebody. It's like, hey, uh, our entrepreneur instincts are often like, hey, go do this and don't call me. But uh, what would your opinion about that strategy be, Tim? You know, I think just the opposite has proven to be more effective in my business and the businesses I've consulted to as well is in the beginning, I want to tell all my team members, call me as much as humanly possible. And in fact, let's actually do a live training every single day for a few hours a day if needed. Because the more that I invest into that person, provided they're a good hire, obviously, um, the more that it's just going to pay off in spades. The compound interest of that initial oomph that we put into our team members will pay off literally in spades in the coming weeks and months. Well, and that's such, a, uh, such an important uh, point to make. Uh, one of the axioms that I repeat often is, and a lot of times this has to do with software, but it really has to do with hiring in my opinion too. And we say if every upgrade is a downgrade at first, right? And so when you hire somebody, sometimes it feels like, what's the, why did I hire somebody? Now I'm working harder than I ever did. And, and you, don't, you don't necessarily see the payoff immediately. Is that your opinion as well? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think that, uh, so I've got something and you, you saw me mention this, Steve, in my presentation for Catalyst was, uh, you know, there's something called the trough of sorrow. And that's the period of time between when you hire someone and when they're actually good enough to break even for the amount of time, energy and money that you have to put into them. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a lottery mindset in the beginning that, oh, if I just hire someone, it's like, a magic diet pill or it's like winning the lottery, like all of a sudden all my problems are going to go away. I get to level up. Life is good. When in fact, like you said, every upgrade is a downgrade in the beginning. And so actually we're worse off because we've got all our current work. Plus we've got the extra work of training someone. And in the first few weeks, we are really not going to see any ROI at all. In fact, our days are probably even longer. And so I think what is crucial, there's a lot that goes into making a great hire for sure. One of them is just the right expectations. And, and yes, the expectations of the assistant, but also of ourselves as much as anything. And so if we can expect that for the first two to four weeks, we're really not gonna have much lighter of a schedule, then I think that helps to avoid an unneeded breakup when things don't happen as quickly as we think they should. Well, I do think that having realistic expectations can make all the difference in the world, but uh, awesomers out there, if you're listening and, and you're not excited by the trough of sorrow and <laughs> downgrades and more work uh, as a result of this, then you just aren't listening hard enough. Uh, we're going to talk all about this uh, trough of sorrow. Uh, how do you actually get the upgrades to work? How do you make the good hires that Tim has talked about and alluded to? And we're going to do it uh, right after this break. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. Okay, awesomers, we're back again. Steve Simonson joined by Tim Francis. And boy, be, we teased before the break that this is, uh, you know, groundbreaking sorrow, troughs of sorrow, uh, downgrades and upgrades. Uh, but really, the reality is, uh, if you get a good hire and somebody who's, you know, properly vetted and properly aligned with your own needs as a company and maybe your own personality, the payoff could be extraordinary, yes? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think that... In the beginning, we have what and how questions. So what should I be doing? How do I do it? And that's great in the beginning of a business. Very soon though, we start realizing that there's only so many hours in the day 
And so oftentimes we graduate into thinking about how can I have a better morning routine or how can I have a better nighttime routine or how can I, how can I be more productive and maybe I'm going to use software tools to track my time and whatnot. And that's fine and dandy. However, at some point we literally tap out our own ability to be effective. And so we then graduate from having what and how problems to actually having who problems. So it's not about what should I be doing or how should I be doing it? It's who should I be hiring to be doing this work for me? And sometimes we can accomplish that with an outside agency. Sometimes we can accomplish that with an outside consultant. Sometimes though, we really do need to hire someone who's, they might be a contractor still, but they're kind of more or less treated like they're an internal person on the team. And, and there's also like a delegation through different phases, right? Or I should say a graduation uh, through the different phases of delegation. And in the very beginning, the, the classic kind of e-myth slash uh, work the system type approach is let's just, let's document things. Let's document everything. And, and something that I think really sets, the e, uh, sets work the system apart from e-myth as a book is uh, Sam Carpenter in Work the System talks about operating principles. Um, and that's like, what's a collection of 20 to 30 guidelines we can give our teammates that they can make decisions for us. So one of my, one of my mentors, his name is Keith Cunningham, and um, he talks about the difference between hands and feet versus head and heart. And, and I, I found in my journey, because for five years I hired overseas and I did my best to make that work. And for a co combination of reasons, it just it was not a fit for me. And, and what I found could work overseas was anything that was more hands and feet work. So data entry, photo editing, anything that's like a very specific task to be done over and over and over again. Maybe it's like basic customer service, something like that. Um, and, and, and where, where there's a real graduation point is when you start hiring team members that are not just hands and feet for you, but they're actually head and heart to use Keith's expression. And so head, head and heart comes down to a couple things. I think that we can, if we can identify what our heart is, I think that explained differently would be what are our core values. And I think Vern Harnish in his book, Scaling Up has an awesome process to help identify your core values. Essentially, you're, you're just telling stories of what's made you really happy or what's made you really frustrated. And then as you list out these stories, buckets start to appear. And then from there, you name those buckets and then you include a couple stories and voila, now we can explain our core values to another team member. So, you know, Art my Profit Factory, we've got three core values. Um, be accountable, transparent, show people that you care and pursue mastery and growth. And I have a couple stories for each of those. And so now when you bring on a new team member, we can teach them that. When we've got a, a challenge or a problem that's come up on the team, um, maybe with a customer or something's, you know, there's an upset of some kind, my teammates know they can just go back and ask themselves in this situation, what would it mean to show people that we care or pursue mastering growth or be accountable and transparent. And it's just such an amazing North star that if people are really clear on that, it makes it a lot easier for them to make decisions on my behalf without having to ask me all the time. So that's, 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 the, that's the, that's the heart. That's the core values. And at some point, if you want to jam on the head part, I'm happy to talk about that too. Both parts are uh, equally interesting, um, and, and I think it's a really, both of those, by the way, good books, uh, uh, Work the System by Sam Carpenter and Scaling Up uh, as well, and, and great lessons to be found in there. What I like is that you've taken some of those things and you made them actionable, right? You've taken some advice from a mentor, you've taken some kind of concepts from books, and you put it into action, and, and you've talked now about the heart, uh, but you said you're going to get into the, the head part, part of the equation. Yeah. So if hands and feet are kind of tasks like SOPs, do this, do that. Um, something, uh, so I got this from Sam talked about operating principles and to me, a more user-friendly term is actually decision-making guidelines. So that's what we refer them to, uh, to them as in my company and with our clients. And so DMGs or decision-making guidelines are anything that allows someone to make a decision almost kind of like based on rules. So one of the most famous examples that most people will know is from the four hour work week when Tim Ferriss said to his outsourced customer service, he said, if it's less than $50, just take care of it and don't ask me for help. So that, that would be an example of a decision-making guideline, something that he can say, here's how to make the decision. And after that, like the person that was doing customer service could operate on their own. So um, I'll give you another example. When I have Sarah book me a condo, um, usually, usually I, I actually prefer to stay in condos uh, whenever I travel. Um, that way I've got a fridge, I've got a kitchen, I can have a morning smoothie, I can kind of stick to my diet uh, a little more closely. 
Um, and, and so I've given her some decision making guidelines. I've said, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to find it on Airbnb um, or VRBO.com or some other way, but I need to be, you know, within a 10 minute walk of the venue that I'm speaking at or that I'm attending an event at. Um, I want the price range to be less than $250 a night. Um, here's like pictures of five condos that I think meet the kind of like the style that I'm looking for. Um, I want it to be whole apartment. I don't want it to be like a room shared in an apartment with other people. Um, and, and so I've kind of given her this list of decision making guidelines and, and I can just say to her, look, as long as it meets these six criteria, book it, you know, you don't have to stop and ask me for help. And then from there, I, on, on even more kind of complicated tasks, sometimes you have to actually put a hierarchy on those, those guidelines. So surprisingly, one of the most difficult things to delegate is booking flights. And, and at first blush, it doesn't really seem like it's all that complicated, but when you start thinking about all the different factors that go into it, it's like, oh my goodness, actually there's like a very complicated rule set here, right? Where I'm saying, I only want to fly in the mornings um, unless the event is happening at night, in which case I want it to be afternoon. And I want to sit aisle instead of, or I want to sit window, not aisle, unless it's in, unless you can get me something in the first 10 rows, then I'll sit anywhere, right? And, and so it's like, what happens if it's with United who I want to fly with, but it's a horrible seat when I could get a great seat with like a, an airline I don't like, you know? So it's, it's actually like incredibly complicated. And so um, what I've found is that uh, best to stick with kind of graduating through the process. So, so if, if there are tasks right away that are SOPable, if you will, and very, you know, just like do this, do that, do this, do that, like redo style tasks, then let's start with those. Let's get that off our plate. Then after that, let's graduate up into simple decisions. So a simple decision would be something like if it's less than $50, just do it. Um, maybe booking a condo would be also be in like the simple uh, category. And then in the complicated category, then we would graduate up to that. And, and the higher we go up, the more that our team members have to be able to make decisions on their own. And for our team members to make decisions on their own, they need to know what our, what's in our head and in our heart. And we do that through decision-making guidelines and core values. Well, again, that makes a lot of sense. And it is quite complex. If anybody's ever done a significant amount of travel and tried to just simply delegate that uh, or, you know, hey, uh, just uh, take care of it for me. And then you're like, oh, I didn't want to fly a red eye. Or, you know, you just start coming up with all these just random things that you never told them, right? They had no, no decision-making guidelines at the time. So how would they know? And uh, it's a, it can be a very painful process. So I love all of this. And I think it's highly relevant to how entrepreneurs operate in business today, particularly when it comes to the hiring process. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. But I want to dive back to the beginning because I think you have a fascinating background. And I'm not sure how many people know about it, but I love it personally. So we know that you are from Canada, you said. But are you, were you born in Canada? Yes, sir. What city was that? Just we want to check your records. Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. All right. I've uh, heard of all of those places. Uh, how about your parents? What, what kind of work did they do? So my mom's a teacher. Um, she's actually going into what might be her last year of teaching this year um, in elementary school. And my dad was a trucker. Then he became a trucking instructor. And then him and a couple of trucking instructors bought a trucking school. So he now owns a trucking school. So he started his entrepreneur journey a little bit later. Um, I think he was probably in his 40s when he became an entrepreneur. Um, and he still owns it to this day. Fascinating. Uh, that that kind of describes the the classic e myth uh, entrepreneurial seizure, right? Where you got a great <laughs> and you kind of wind your way up. But uh, does he like that business? Is it a good business for him? Is you know what? Ride, so to speak. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Truck> humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, yeah, my, my dad is certainly very passionate about the industry. Um, he even gets interviewed from time to time on the news about his opinion of, of where the, the industry is going. And it is an industry that I think has a lot of transition coming um, with autonomous vehicles uh, now taking to the road. Uh, Coors Light had a shipment uh, of beer uh, between some of their Colorado facilities literally, uh, I think it was about a year ago, and it ran with an autonomous truck with a human just in the passenger seat. So my dad and I, from time to time, will we'll talk about what's coming down the road. Truck humor there for you. I like that. Down um, the road. <laughs> All, right. Uh, all right, that's one for one. Uh, everybody keep a score at home or even up here. Uh, so I, I do think there's a lot of transition. Of course, that industry has an extraordinary um, lack of drivers right now. So there's still kind of this, this precipice of still opportunity, still demand, but 
you know, the, the robots are coming. They're just plain coming. Uh, and when right. you see the, the Tesla beautiful truck and, you know, you don't have to change the brakes for the first million miles, you, you, your mind just blows up when you, when you kind of dive in. So I find that uh, very interesting. How about any siblings uh, up there in the great north? Oh, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I oftentimes say, so I'm the oldest of three kids. And, and I think, you know, I, I was the test subject and my parents got a better version each time. You know, like, I'm just so proud of my brother and my sister. Um, you know, both just such incredible human beings. Um, my, my, it's me and then uh, two and a half years younger is my brother. Um, and he is a, a policy analyst, so he's like a political science guy and just like so brilliant. Like if you ever want one of the most fascinating dinner party guests of all time, just invite my brother. He can talk about almost any topic with you and, and, and you'll feel like dazzled and entertained and he's hilarious. Uh, my sister is about seven years younger than me. Uh, she's an occupational therapist um, and so she's got her master's. She just got married up in Canada, so I went up for that. And uh, just one of the most grounded human beings like her head is just screwed on straight and um yeah i just i totally revere both of my siblings i love it sounds like a very uh, nicely balanced family how about uh any university did you uh partake of the uh college experience yeah so my first year was at the university of ottawa um i was a house of commons page so that meant that i was a messenger down on the floor with the prime minister of canada and the minister of defense and the minister of industry and so i actually got to fascinate them uh, when i was 17 years old and uh, do it in two languages, in English and in French. So that was a great experience. And uh, I also academically did not do well that year at all. I was living uh, thousands of, of miles away from home. And uh, I would work in like the, the halls of parliament by day and take classes by day. I mean, I didn't go that often, but theoretically I was going to classes at the University of Ottawa. And then by night I would brew my own beer. And I would literally sell it to my floor mates. And it was like different galaxy. It was like 12%, 13%. It did not taste good at all, but it certainly got the job done, if you know what I mean. Well, you know, if, if somebody asked me what the college experience was like in Canada, I would have described the beer making part for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Class and beer making. I, I, I would have missed out on the page business. But so how about after Ottawa? Did you carry on or did you drop out? What was your, what was your resolution there? Yeah, I appreciate you asking all this. So I, with a, like a 1.3 GPA, I knew I needed some structure. And so, so I, moved, I moved back home. And I actually had this dream of one day being a, a, some kind of an elite athlete. And so uh, I was a walk-on at Grant McEwen College in Edmonton. And I was surprisingly chosen. I was definitely the worst player on the team. Um, I think the reason the coach brought me on was because he saw how hard I worked. And he knew that if he had a hardworking red shirt kind of guy on the floor that uh, all the talented guys would have to work hard and practice or else they get beat by the, the crappy guy. So well, I, let me just ask you as a matter of history, what, what year was the movie Rudy coming out as it related to this? Because this sounds a lot like the movie Rudy to me. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. I think Rudy came out in the nineties and um, yeah. And, uh, and actually there is a bit of a Rudy esque conclusion to this in that, by the second half of the season, I actually did make the starting roster. And by the end of the year, I'd won player of the game um, in the second last game of the year. And I did win most improved player at the end of year athletics uh, gala. So it was a really important year. And after that, I was just, I just wanted to get done with university. So I then switched over to uh, the University of Alberta. Um, I got rejected from business school three times along the way. Never finished a business degree. I actually got a kinesiology degree all about uh, health and wellness. Fascinating. So um, I'm glad we're having this talk and maybe this is a good time for the intervention. It's not going to work for you in business, Tim. I, I just, I have to tell you, me and your college has, have met, we've decided that, that <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah, that's it. So uh, what is the basis that somebody can be rejected from business school? I'm, obviously, it's not based on your acumen or talent. Was it based just on the prior grades or that you want to be a sportsman? What, what was the basis of that? You know what? I had um, in my second year when I was a college athlete, I had to have good grades or else I wasn't going to get my scholarship, my athletic scholarship, um, and I was going to get kicked off the team. So my GPA the second year was actually 4.0. I had a perfect GPA, and yet I couldn't finish calculus for the life of me. And because I couldn't finish that one single class, I just could not get into business school. So, it, it, you know, years and years later, I ended up getting invited to be a guest lecturer at NYU in, in New York City. And it was in business school at NYU in a business leadership class. And I walked in there 
And I didn't know if I should just laugh at how ridiculous life works out sometimes, or if I should be smug, or if I should, you know, how I should handle that. But I mean, in the end, I ended up handling it with grace and poise and a lot of gratitude to be there and to just help the students that were in the class. Yeah, I probably would have uh, would have had a meltdown. This is what I'm talking about. You know, no, <laughs> I, I really, I, I like, I do find the irony of that whole scenario to be delightful, to be personal. Uh, I, I think it's great. And, and this just goes to show that, you know, some of these things, some of these barriers that are out there are quite arbitrary in life, right? The, the, I don't know if you ever got good at calculus or if you like calculus today, but how many of us have ever been held up in the street and it's like, hey, pal, answer this equation or you're, you know, I'm finishing you right here, right now. It's never happened. And it, it certainly hasn't slowed down your, uh, you know, explosive career so far. So I love, I do love that, uh, the irony of that story. Um, so how about as you came out of university, presumably uh, you, you finished up at that because you said you wanted to accelerate your um, exit there. D did you end up graduating? And, and if so, what was your first job out of college? Yeah, so it took me, uh, I, I put myself on the five and a half year plan to finish a four year degree. <laughs> the fast track, we call it in the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So I, uh, I finished with my degree. And actually, my first job was uh, at the Women's Federal Penitentiary up in Canada. And so there was around 120 women inmates, medium, minimum, medium, and maximum security. And, um, and from there, uh, I got the experience of what it would be like to be a pretty girl walking by a construction site, you know, because the, role, you know, the roles were reversed. You know, I, I'm the fitness guy at a gym, and that gym's just located in a women's only. So 120 women prisoners there was something like 64 staff and 62 were women. So there was like two dudes in the whole place. And so, um, you know, what, what that gave me, Steve, was just such an appreciation for where I'd come from. Um, you know, Warren Buffett has this expression, he calls it the ovarian lottery, that he didn't choose to be born as a white guy to, you know, fa a, fa a family that was fairly well off in, in uh, middle America, you know, and nor did I pick to be a, a white guy in a healthy family in Canada. And, and you know, I'd, I'd have to walk through the prison security gates and have all my shoes and bags scanned every single time going in. And every time that that double door, you know, that gate would kind of clunk behind me, it would just dawn on me, you know what? Like we really don't all start in the same place in life. You know, that the, there were people in that prison that were born addicted to drugs. They were born with fetal alcohol syndrome. They were born with holes in their little baby lungs because their mothers had smoked during pregnancy. And I, I, I mean, <laughs> it's just such a different place to start in life. And to know that I had the advantages of a healthy body right from day one and a healthy family and environment, I, I, I had taken that for granted for a very long time. And that job had given me an opportunity to see kind of a wider scope of, of life. What a unique lens to see and, and take the moment to be grateful for. Hopefully you, you saw it at the time, but certainly in retrospect, it's clear enough. And too often we don't, we don't have the, you know, anything we have is kind of, we take it for granted. We expect it at that point, right? There is no going backwards on what we have. There's only going up. And uh, to be able to, particularly, I, I think it's appropriate to, to appreciate where you came from, right? And for those of us that had the opportunity to have, you know, nice childhood and a, and a pretty normal family and so on and so forth. We shouldn't take that for granted because not everybody had it so easy. And that makes their, you know, road on the awesomer journey that much more difficult to get started. So I, I definitely appreciate that. How about, um, was there any lesson you learned on the way? Because I, I know at some point you joined a band and there had to be some lessons from that band. That, that's, a, that, that's a weird kind of, I don't even know how that band started. When, when did that band start? Yeah, so that band started um, in around 2006 or so, uh, 2005, 2006, I don't remember exactly when. Um, but I had my first ever business, which is a painting company. So I did student painting. And, and so there was a day when I had to go to a 9 a.m. meeting on the other side of the city, and I had to meet up with all my crews in the morning to hook them up with all their paint before I got there. And I, and I was told by the area manager that if I was late, he was going to find me. And I had like, like my business was topping. So I had to rush, 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 rush. So I was, I was cruising down 142nd street in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, 
going to the paint store and a cop steps out and points at me. I thought, oh, damn it. I just got a speeding ticket. So he pulls me over and I explain my situation. And while he's writing up the ticket, I'm calling the manager and I said, you know, I'm going to be late. I'm so sorry. Like it was going to be a close shave as it was, but now I'm really going to be late because of this ticket. And the manager said, that's too bad. I'm going to find you anyways, if you're not here on time. So I said, oh my God. So made it to the paint store, made it all my crews, dropped off all the paint. And then after that, I was busting down Grote Road in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And guess what happens? A second cop steps out, points at me, and I go, oh my God, two speeding tickets in like 25 minutes. Are you serious? So I was back on the phone telling the area manager, if I wasn't going to be late before, I'm really, really going to be late now. And he said, well, it's not nine o'clock yet. If you're not here though, I'm going to find you. I just thought, oh my God. So by the time I finally got there, it was probably, you know, 9.30, 9.45, something like that. And uh, it just so happens as I was walking towards the conference room, one of my fellow managers for a different kind of territory, uh, he had stepped out and he looked at me and said, dude, you look horrible. Let me take you for a beer. Um, actually, no, it was an 8 a.m. meeting because when we went down for the beer at 8.45, they couldn't even serve us yet. So we waited until 9 a.m. One beer turned into two, turned into a pitcher. And at one point he said, hey, do you play any instruments? And I said, uh, yeah, actually I play drums. And um, so before we knew it, we were talking about jamming. We got together for one jam, which then turned into a show, which turned into 147 shows, three sponsors, airplay in eight different cities. And we made it all the way to the Western Canadian Music Awards over the span of about six years. And the crazy thing is 20 minutes before that show at the WCMAs, we broke up in the parking lot in the band van. So such a band story, you know what I mean? Such a band story. And, and I think that, you know, I got a couple really valuable lessons out of it. I mean, first of all, who gets to do that in their lifetime? What a, what a great experience. Um, you know, just living the dream literally. Right. Um, secondly, um, I, I really had you know, like just a gift for presenting and public speaking and all the rest and, and just learning what it means to be a performer is so helpful in my business life now. And, and furthermore, you know, there's something about learning about being on a team, you know, and I'd done it in sports my whole life and now I was doing it with these guys and, um, you know, and, and people, people just change, you know, their, their goals change over time, life goes on and whatnot. And ultimately I think that's what happened at the end was, the other guys, they kind of wanted to move on towards being married with kids and whatnot. And, and I just wanted to tour longer, harder, faster, put more money in, go bigger. And, uh, and I guess it just wasn't in the cards. So it was right after that, that, um, I, you know, I, I had kind of a day of reckoning when it came to the music industry. Up until then, I'd been touring at the band and that would be by night that I would do sound check, play shows. And, and then in the early mornings, I would do radio interviews. In the afternoons though, there was nothing to do. I'd be sitting in my hotel room, with the guys sometimes, sometimes on my own. And so I started learning how to invest in real estate. And so literally as evenings and weekends, I was a weekend warrior playing music. By day in Edmonton, I would acquire houses. And so I had four houses and uh, so about a million dollars, million, million, two worth of property. And so that was- let me, let me just ask you a question because I, I, I love this story so far. Um, and by the way, uh, shout out to uh, Canada for being uh, civilized, uh, not serving beer before 9 a.m., because <laughs> 845 is such a difference. Uh, and, and, and what an incredible story, by the way, breaking up just before the award show, before you have to play, uh, you know, hashtag we thought of this beforehand. Um, but I, I'm, I'm just curious, as, as you're putting all of this together, were you actually able to make a living as a band guy? I mean, you, you said you were doing the house thing in the middle of the day, but I didn't see any revenue production to be able to buy the houses if you're doing sound checks at night and playing at night and, and radio stuff in the morning. Where'd the money come from? Yes, that's a very astute observation. So we made enough money playing shows that we could kind of cover like life bills, if you know what I mean, hmm. um, and band bills, if you will. Um, however, certainly not enough money for me to put down payments on houses. So some of those courses I'd taken were on how to buy houses with no money down. And so I acquired basically all four with basically none of my own money. And, um, and, and that was great. You know, I was on the path to being rich and famous, right? You know, Ooh, that's the, the dream. yeah, the band would, 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 would get me girls and, and, uh, the, the, and fame and the real estate stuff would make me rich. So then 2008 hit Steve, Ooh, right? I remember. And, and I ended up losing around a hundred thousand dollars, mostly of other people's money. And uh, that was very stressful. So then I was scrambling to try and find cash. And there was a speaker touring on Western Canada who promised in one year he could teach me how to be very wealthy. And um, 
So not only did I attend his seminar, but I offered to promote him. And so along the way, he said, if you really want to fast track this, you need to give me $20,000 and I will give you my inner circle type training. And I thought, okay, this is it. There was one minor problem though, is I was already down a hundred and where I'm going to come up with another 20. So he said, well, you're an entrepreneur, you'll figure it out. So I did. So I went and I raised another $20,000 and gave it to him. And it was about a six day course. And on day four, I realized this is one of the worst courses I've ever taken. And there's no way he's going to teach me what I need to know to fulfill on the promise of becoming wealthy in one year. So I, uh, so I was down 120 now, not just 100, 120. And I was working 80 hour work weeks and uh, I had the stress of all of it. So the stress and the fatigue together really came together. And on December the 26, 2010, um, so the day after Christmas, I noticed that my ankle was starting to swell. And I showed it to my family. I, I, was, I went to pick up my family. We were going to go shopping. Boxing Day shopping is a big thing in Canada. Canada, Boxing Day, sure. Yeah. And we were in Edmonton at West Edmonton Mall, which is North America's largest shopping mall, even bigger than the Mall of America um, in Minnesota. And, uh, and there was just no way I was walking on this ankle. It, was, it looked like I'd rolled at playing basketball or something. And five days later, on December the 31st, so New Year's Eve, I was hosting a New Year's Eve party at my house. I couldn't even stand. And, and thus began a three month journey of erythema nodosum was the illness that I had. And it meant that I couldn't really stand or walk for, for the full three months. And so there was a, a moment where I had to, you know, it really hit me. It's like, I can either sit on this laundry hamper that my mom has flipped upside down in the tub uh, for me to sit on so I can bathe myself or I can get a sponge bath for my mom. And this is like a dramatic, dramatic change from having a million two worth of property and playing shows at the Western Canadian Music Awards, the sponsors and all, to now not having the houses, being down 120, and I can't even walk. Yeah, that is crazy stuff. And uh, not an ideal Sophie's choice of ba bathing options either, frankly. Uh, you, know, the, as, you know, clearly this was a defining moment in your life. You know, you're down, you're, you're ultimately, you're sick. You, you actually have a you know, an ailment that is bringing you physically to your knees or, you know, on your back, in this case, literally on your back. Um, how did you, how did it resolve? I mean, I, I just, uh, how, how did you go on? It seems like uh, you, you don't seem like you're having problems right now, for example. So, you know, we think about, you know, health, wealth, and relationships as kind of three areas of life. Health was down, you know, worst it's ever been. Wealth was down. Worse it's ever been. Had I not had my family, and by that I mean my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, and, and my girlfriend at the time, you know, Steve, I, 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 I would have been bankrupt, homeless, everything. I, you know, it would have been dire, dire, dire circumstances when you can't even walk, yeah, right? Crazy. Uh, so I, I had it not been for my family, you know, and, and, and I mean, not just to like take me back in, in their home and whatnot, but I mean, also like my mom paid my mortgage for me for three months. Um, you know, and my girlfriend didn't dump me, you know what I mean? Like it was, it was a really, really, really dark and tough time. And so there was this one day when I was laying in bed day after day and, and I felt this warmth in my body and in my body, like it was one of those kind of, movie moments, if you will, you're like, oh, that only ever happens in the movie. Well, it happened to me. And, and I think it required me to be that still for that long to hear what I needed to hear. And there was actually a very quiet voice that said to me, Tim, is this what you want? And in that moment, like Steve, I don't know if a second went by or a minute or an hour, like time stood still. And it, and then I heard another voice, which I later realized was my own. And it, it, that voice is even weaker and meeker. And it said, yes, this is what I want. And from that moment on, these dominoes started to fall in my head, my heart, my spirit. I realized that all along, I had been chasing fame and fortune and, and an outcome. And I was trying to shortcut success. I was trying to just be the lottery winner, if you will, of being an entrepreneur. And... Um, and, and I also realized, so there's a, a book, uh, maybe you've read it, Steve, it's called Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. No. I haven't heard of that one. 
So he talks about um, how he took his e-commerce website, limos.com, um, built it up, sold it, and what he learned along the way. And um, in the book, he talks about there's consumer mindset versus producer mindset. And so consumer mindset is how can I get more things? How can I buy more stuff? How can I be in a rap video? You know, more or less, right? Sure. And, I, and I realized that had been my thinking. And what I needed to graduate to was irrespective of whether I ever become rich and famous, irrespective of any of the material trappings, irrespective of how much I may ever be able to consume, I need to become a craftsman. There's a great book called So Good They Can't Ignore You. And in that book, um, the author talks about the craftsman mindset, like, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan or Eddie Van Halen or any of these great guitarists, Kirk Hammett from Metallica or whatnot, like, they're practicing every single day, two to three hours. And that's what a craftsman does. And, and so what I realized was if all I did for the rest of my life was get a little bit better at entrepreneurship with every week that goes by, even if I'm never rich and famous, that, that would be a life well lived. And so since, since April of 2011 until today in 2018, that has been my singular focus, has been how do I get better at the blocking and tackling, the dirty work, the, you know, whether it's writing an SOP or studying financials, you know, and, and whether, even if it's a topic I hate, like accounting and, or bookkeeping or something, if I want to be a pro, if I want to be a pro, then there's just certain things that have to come. And so like you talk about eating your vegetables, right? There's just certain things you got to do if you want to be a pro. And, and that's been my path ever since. I love that, that just the, the nomenclature of being a craftsman, right? Because it doesn't matter really what, whatever trade that you want to be in. You use musicians as, as an example, um, whether it's an entrepreneur or, you know, it could be a physical craftsman. Maybe you, you set tile or you, you know, any of it, but it's, it's the idea that we're going to ascend to a level that, that uh, whatever the, the other book you mentioned that, you know, nobody can question your, your the, the quality of what you produce. What, what was that book called? So good. They, so good you so good they can't ignore you yeah thank you for that one i haven't read that one but uh i love these book uh recommends because half of these i probably read and half i have not uh so that gives me some homework um so i mean these these are obviously defining moments and huge lessons learned and and you know i i have to ask you during that time particularly maybe when you're uh you know down and out on your back and the financial stuff's in front of you and you know it's it's so hard to see your way out of that, not, not just the health stuff, but the financial stuff. It always seems like such a, a cloud over people's head. Uh, was there ever a time you just wanted to give up and it's like, you know what, I'm just going to declare bankruptcy. I'm going to go get a job, uh, whatever, working at the post office, digging ditches. Did you ever just, just want to check out of the deal? You know what, Steve? Um, the story that I wrapped around the whole thing is that this is a defining moment of my life. And it's because I'm going to make it through this that I'm going to get experience, wisdom, and education that is impossible to get any other way. And, and I had no idea how I was going to pay off 120 grand. And I had no idea how I'd walk again. And I had no idea how anybody would ever believe in me again. I had given the world all the reasons to not believe in me. I'd lost money. Uh, I'd had businesses go to zero. I clearly was not effective at producing revenue, any plus of it. The, plus the two speeding tickets, just for those keeping score at home, because uh, you know, that, that's going to that's gonna eat away at your uh, driver score. So uh, all of that, as, as you put that framework together, are, are you saying you had the clarity of mind at that time to go, you know what, however I get through this, this will be how, you know, this is my moment to shine, because that, that's extraordinary uh, to have that kind of foresight at that time. You know, I... I, I I, I thank you for the kind words and it, it did it, there was not an ounce of glamour to any of it you know there was not a, an ounce of heroism to any of it it was it was it was gritty it was you know and, and it was a humbling it was a humbling experience that needed to happen is is exactly what it was i thought i could cheat the process of becoming an entrepreneur and, and, and along the way, you know, Steve, when I was 19 and I had that painting company, I sold 40 grand in a summer and I thought that I was going to be like, you know, the big deal on campus come the following fall at university because here I'd made all this money. Well, at the end of the summer, 
the bills started rolling in from the paint store and workers comp and all the rest. And I actually had between 41 and $43,000 worth of bills. So I actually lost money that summer. Right. And, and I was so childish about that experience that I said, screw painting. I'm never doing it again. If there's one thing I promised to myself is I will never paint the inside or the outside of another house again. So that was 2001. Fast forward 10 years later, 2011, I'm laying in bed and I had been so hopped up on the Kool-Aid of getting rich quick that, you know, I was above all this other stuff. Then the illness hit and I went, oh my God, I am like, it would be an upgrade to be on my knees. I was on my back and I had to ask myself, there's no more room for learning the next domination method or the next freedom formula. I can, I got like, I got to pay rent in the next seven days. I can't take a course next week. I can't take a course for five days. I can't even take like the 12 day mini course. That's too long. What is in my immediate environment right now that I can do that's going to make money? What skills do I have that are instantly marketable and instantly monetizable? And as I felt into that question, it hit me, Steve. Painting. Wax on, wax off, baby. You are prepared. So off I went. And with tail between my legs and ears pinned back, I humbly went to, you know, my mom, who's a teacher. And, you know, up until that point, I told her that being a teacher was a dumb financial move and I'd been all righteous about it. And now here I was going to her, not only to care for me, but also to say, hey, you know, do you think there's any teachers at your school that need some painting done? And I was going, you know, it was humbling and it needed to happen. So here's what happened is I got some painting jobs and I would tell folks, the homeowners, that they would get one of the best paint jobs they'd ever gotten. We're talking no hits on the ceiling. It's going to be one of the cleanest jobs they've ever seen. It would be one of the quietest painting jobs they'd ever received. And it would be an incredible deal because I was only going to charge them 25 bucks an hour and the going rate is like 40 to 50 bucks an hour for a painter. And I said, in return, I need, I need a couple things. One is the 25 bucks an hour. And the second is I need permission from you and agreement, not just permission, but agreement that I'm welcome to paint any time, day or night. So that gave me the space during the day to study marketing programs, to try and find marketing clients and to basically build the business I wanted to. And then I would have supper. And then with a lot of resistance, with a lot of resistance in my own head and heart, I would then get into my car and I would go paint and families would be shocked when I would show up at like 11 at night to start painting and I would paint. And while I was painting, I would have headphones on and I'd listen to more about marketing, you know, mindset, all the rest. And I'd paint till five, six in the morning. I'd see them off to work or whatever. I would quietly leave. I'd get three, four hours of sleep. I would then go back to doing marketing by day and then I'd paint at night. And I would just, I did that for probably four or five months just to make enough money. My, my metric for success, Steve, was not how much can I sell or, you know, how grandiose my life could be. My metric for success was literally no joke. And my mom and I still joke about this today. How many months can I go in a row without borrowing more money from my mom? That was literally my metric for success. Nothing else mattered. No Lamborghinis, no beach lifestyle, no laptop lifestyle. Literally, I just got to take care of what's right in front of me. And by taking care of that, Steve, it allowed me to take care of the next thing and the next thing after that. And then before I knew it, I woke up one day and I went, oh, I don't have to paint anymore. I got a marketing company. And so then the marketing company got to a point where I go, oh, I don't need to do this on my own anymore. I can hire someone, right? And, and so, you know, I think there's something to be said about just take care, just what's the next step and just focus on that. I really do appreciate the fact, first of all, the, the journey is extraordinary. And, and I do think there's a, a fair amount of strength and persistence that goes along with it. But for all of those awesomers out there that, you know, either are in the middle of the struggle or have seen similar struggles, just know that there's a solution to every problem, right? And, and you just incrementally kind of work the problem until it's solved, until it's gone. That's, that's the reality of what Tim had to do. And, and I think you've told the story uh, quite well as far as how you kind of, you know, put yourself in this mindset originally of the fame and the glamour, which is fleeting and, uh, in, in my view, inconsequential, and, and got into the uh, view of how do I deliver value? How do I just you know, make my own way in the world. So where I have happiness and satisfaction, and as you said earlier, I have a life worth living. That is so often, particularly in this Instagram culture of, 
you know, look at me on my private jet and look at me doing this. And, and all of that is just such fleeting nonsense, in, in my opinion. And, and again, you know, I, I've had pretty reasonable success along the way. It doesn't mean I don't like nice things, but I don't measure myself by how many Lamborghinis are in the garage or how many islands I own or any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's, it's just not what really matters in life. Uh, what, what's your thoughts? I just, I just really, like I haven't felt that level of struggle as I felt back then for quite a while. And, and so for anyone who's listening who has that, I mean, you know, like that can be extremely bleak to be in a situation like that. And like the suffering can be intense. And I just, I just want to let everyone out there know a couple things. One is like, there's always, always hope. There's always hope. And even if it's like just a pinprick of light way off in the distance, and it seems like almost impossible, it feels like you're holding on by a thread. There is always, always hope. And, and, you know, whether it's Steve's story or my story or someone from Shark Tank or whatever, please have faith that, yes, you can make it. And, and I think a huge tactical part of what helped me to make it were, was actually the questions I asked myself along the way. Our brain will literally answer the questions that we give it. Had I asked questions like, why me? Or why did this happen to me? Or... Um, how could this happen to me? I mean, I would have come up with thousands of reasons and it possibly could have been too much and could have broken my spirit. For whatever reason, probably because I'd been taken, taking some personal development courses prior to getting sick, the different, I asked a different question. And that question was, what have I done to bring this about? And I realized I had a huge role to play in it, right? I had been desperate to become rich. And that caused me to get involved in real estate. And I was inexperienced. So of course I made some investments that made no sense. And I wanted so badly to hear that I could get rich in a year that when someone came along and said, I can help you get rich in a year, I said, hallelujah, you know, sign me up. You know, I'll take that Kool-Aid by the dozen, you know? And, and, and then after that, like, not only was it enough to study with this guy is I had to find a way to promote him and I had to find a way to spend the 20 grand to get the best training. And, and you know what, like I had done all of that. And, and, and what I came to accept about myself was that it's not that I'm an idiot. It's not that I'm dumb. It's not that I'm incapable. It's that I climb ladders. And when I see a ladder I want to climb, I go for it whole hog. And you know what, if I find out that that ladder's leaning on the wrong wall, well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a fall, but what's not going to change about like, what's going to change is I'm probably going to pick a different ladder next time leaning on a different wall, but what's not going to change is my ambition and my desire to find ladders, climb them and scale them and get to the top. And, and so I think, I think another question in addition to what have I caught, you know, what, what have I done uh, to bring this about is also what can I do to move beyond the situation? And it's, and it's not, it's not the question of, how come I don't have the money? How come I don't have the time? Or, oh, you said, it's, it's how can I? And if you pick almost any objection, any objection in your life, you know, I can't seem to lose weight. I can't seem to find the partner of my dreams. I can't seem to insert whatever. Take that whatever and just stick how can I in front of it and just see what starts coming up in your brain and see what starts coming up in your environment. And sometimes it's as fast as within seconds, you'll start to see new possibilities. Give it some, give it a few days though. Give it maybe a week journal on that question in the mornings, you know, or in the evenings, whatever your routines are. And you will be astounded with the new possibilities that come up. Also, if you go to people, you know, who are even just a little bit further down the path from you and you ask them the same question, you say to them, Hey, based on what you know about me, how can I raise some money? How can I learn Google AdWords or Facebook ads or whatever, or how can I become more financially successful? you'll be astounded at the number of people who are able to help. Now, that being said, pick people who, who are doing it or have done it. You know, don't, don't pick people who have a different dream than what it, than what it is that you want. Yeah, now that's so much uh, really sage wisdom packed in there. Uh, I, I agree with so much of that from the, the premise of, you know, you can get through it and, and getting your mind right is, you know, a, a key part of this. We, we really are the sum of our prior actions at the end of the day. 
it, no matter what people want to say or, you know, or uh, at the end of the day, we have made choices that, that kind of put us where we are today. And it, we can make other choices to, to modify that uh, and, and improve that uh, along the way if we're not satisfied with where we are. And I think that's an important point. Uh, I tell you this, uh, Tim, before we jump in, because I, I want to talk about uh, one of the, the coolest initiatives that I've heard of in a while, the, the greatassistance.com. Is that the right uh, website? I want to talk about that after the, the break because it's a really cool system for bringing on talented help. And I had the chance to, to see kind of the in-depth version of this at a recent Catalyst 88 uh, event at the Mastermind. Uh, but I want to share this with, you know, just a kind of a, a thumbnail sketch with the, the viewers. But we're going to have to do that right after this, please. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empower is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, guys, we're back again. Steve Simonson here with Tim Francis. And boy, it's been quite a journey so far. Uh, I, I love this kind of origin story because it, it really does help reinforce that, you know, we can get through whatever it is. We all can and you have done and, and kudos to you. Um, but I want to take just a little bit of time to, to bring it to, forward to the present day because you've overcome and you've triumphed and put together a lot of great companies, but one of your newer initiatives, this is uh, a couple years old maybe, I, I don't know the exact time frame, but tell us about greatassistance.com because this is, to me, a fascinating solution to a, a co common problem. Yeah, so when I was sick on my back, um, I realized that if I was ever gonna fulfill my potential as an entrepreneur, I had to build a team. And it didn't have to be a massive team, but I just, I needed help. Um, up until that point, I had kind of said things like, well, you know, no one can do it as well as me. Um, I don't want to have to let go of control. I don't know if I could ever trust someone. Um, you know, I don't want to have to take the time to train someone else so that I can do it faster just by doing it myself. Right. I'd said all those things that a lot of entrepreneurs say I, I was just the same. And, and I, and I also tried a lot of kind of $4 an hour help and just kind of, one foot in, one foot out. And, and when I was sick, I just realized like amateur hour is over. Like amateur hour is so over. I, I have, I didn't know how I would afford a North American assistant. I didn't know what I would delegate first. Um, yeah, I just, there's so much I didn't know. And yet there is no turning back. There is just no turning back. And I think that's a key point, especially when we're in a tough spot is we don't have to have all the answers. We just need to have enough of the answers to be able to take just the next step. We don't have to solve this thing once and for all. So along the way, I ended up, um, you know, I tried uh, the Philippines, India, Jamaica, Pakistan, $4 an hour to $10 an hour, $15 an hour. And then I had also tried North American help, like an Infusionsoft specialist or some kind of like a technical specialist for a hundred bucks an hour. And and like, I barely could afford really any of it. And so what I ended up discovering was that for between about 17 to $20 an hour, I could actually get a North American assistant um, who, you know, similar same time zone, similar same culture, same first language. And as soon as I started working with Sarah, who I found five years ago, instantly all my headaches started to alleviate. It was like night and day between the help that I used to get overseas and the help that I got stateside. Um, and you know, if someone listening to this is in Australia, then get someone from Australia or New Zealand. If someone's listening to this in Canada, get someone from Canada or the United States, like just make it regional. Right. And, um, in the very beginning, cause I, I could barely, barely, barely afford her. All I did was I hired Sarah for five hours a week. And at the time she was getting paid $15 an hour. And, and I started small. I started with sending customer invoices and uploading podcast episodes. That was it. And she did well with that. So then we handed off uploading blog posts. And then after that, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Within a month or two, I was actually astounded that things were getting done while I was sleeping, you know, and things were getting done while I was on client meetings, like admin stuff was happening. And, uh, and very quickly, Sarah was taking huge chunks of work off my plate. Along the way, a lot of entrepreneurs were watching me 
as I was graduating through these different levels and, and I was just spending more and more time focused on high level work, which then allowed me to actually get more customers. And as I got more customers, then I had more money. So then I could hire Sarah more to get more of my time back. And the more I got time, the more I could make money to make more time to get more money. And this positive profit loop just started climbing higher and higher and higher. And at the time I was a marketing consultant and I could take my consulting rate from $40 an hour to 50 to hundred to 250. And then I ended up pivoting a bit into management operations and finance. And I took some more courses on that. Consulting rate went up to $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour. And now here we are today. And I contribute regularly to Forbes and guest lecturing at different universities and whatnot. So there's just such a, such a positive profit loop that got kicked off by me starting small with the very first few tasks. And now people will say to me, oh, of course you've got an assistant, Tim. You charge $1,000 an hour. And I'll say to them, it's actually just the opposite. I make $1,000 an hour today because I got an assistant back when I was charging only $40 an hour. And whether someone's in e-commerce or is a consultant or, you know, is an expert author or, you know, owns a barbershop, for goodness sakes, it's like irrespective of the business, that exact same principle applies is climbing that 80-20 curve of impact and income and all the rest by climbing that positive profit loop. So along the way, I realized that a huge part of it was getting a great assistant for sure. There's no question about that. Like when you get a great assistant, life changes, life absolutely changes. And I also realized that being a great leader was a huge part of the equation as well. Things like how do I delegate? Things like how do I meet with them regularly? Things like how do I, how do I just even pay attention to them as human beings? Like my assistant has kids and a husband and like what's, how can I support the totality of her life and whatnot? And, and as I saw that kind of playing out, I just got better and better and better at hiring assistants for my clients. And then pretty soon I saw that almost every client that I was working with, not all of them, but almost all of them were missing a great assistant. And so I realized there was, a, there was an opportunity there to help entrepreneurs in a very profound way. Um, I ended up hiring a team of five people to work for me and with me. And now we've placed, I think it's over 160 or 170 assistants over the last couple of years. And it has been it has been extraordinary to see the growth of our client companies. Uh, one of my favorite stories is one of our clients, his name is Jimmy Jays. And uh, he had this, this product idea on his, on his mind for like three or four years, but he could just never get around to the required work to launch it. And so he sat in one of my presentations, a live talk I gave about great assistant. And I gave the whole method as to how we find great assistants and whatnot. And he said, ah, it looks like too much work. And I mean, it is a lot of work if you're going to do this thing properly. It's like 50 to 100 hours. You're probably looking at 50 to 100 applicants. Like it's a lot of work. He said, uh, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go on Craigslist and I'm going to just put something on Facebook and see if someone's sister-in-law is available. So he did that. He got, he got an assistant and hired the second person, you know, that he met and lo and behold, it didn't work out. So Shocking. boy, spoiler yeah. alert. Come on. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. Spoiler spoiler alert there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then he went back to struggling on his own. And so this kind of whole period was about six months. Then after that, he said, ah, geez, I got to get back on getting the system. So he pinged me a second time and he said, okay, Tim, I'm ready. You know, I'm now I'm ready to like follow the great assistant methods. So, so he did, um, he got his assistant who's still with him today and it took about six months, but he was able to get like, it was like at least 50, 60% of his work off his plate. And he was also able to finally launch this new product that had been sitting in his backlog forever. So that's the second six month chunk was kind of transitioning. And in the six months since then, in the third chunk of six months here, he's now made an extra quarter million dollars on that new product. And how long has that just been sitting waiting to happen? And oh boy. opportunity yeah. costs, I have to say, and uh, sorry to jump in on you there, but it is, it is so important for, for entrepreneurs and awesomers in general to understand that you can't literally buy time right there there and some people say time is money right and and i have to say time is infinitely more valuable than money that because you can't literally buy it but this is the closest way that you can you can leverage money to gain time right and to me it's a twofer because if, if you look at the great assistant um the greatassistance.com website they have a process where you can go and have them do all the work for you to help you find a great assistant and i've seen the process in depth it's quite comprehensive and so already you've picked up a ton of time. You save that hundred, you know, fifty to hundred hours or whatever it is. And by the way, 
they're not pleasurable hours. This is not <laughs> time on a pleasure cruise hours, right? How much time do you spend on the beach hours? This is like, uh, no, we're digging in the coal mine kind of time. And, and every part of that process is not something I enjoy. So you pick up that, that's the one for the two for is when you actually get the assistant on boarded and you get through the training process, you get through that trough of sorrow. And I'll have you talk a little bit more about that. That's when the leverage really starts to pay off. And in, in your case, uh, your example case that you gave there, the, the new product is being launched. His time is being freed up. There's probably not just a, a productivity factor, but there's probably an intangible happiness factor that goes along with that. Is that fair to say? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, it's, I, I'm all up for suffering through the beginning of a project just to get it off the ground, you know, put in the hard yards that way. And I think that that's un inevitable, whether it's launching a whole business or a project or a campaign. Um, but goodness gracious, as soon as possible, we have got to graduate into focusing on our zone of genius or our unique ability, who, you know, whoever it is that you study. Um, because really, you know, if what you're really great at is picking products, or speaking or consulting or whatever that may be, we got to get you into that power zone as soon as possible. And I get it because I've been there. I've been there many times in the very beginning. Yeah, you got to be the, the dishwasher and the bottle washer and the CEO of the company all at the same time. And that's okay. But as soon as you've got the margin, and I think that that's such a, a, an under discussed topic in business is margin. Everyone wants to talk about top line sales, which is the gl glitzy uh, vanity metric, right? Um, as soon as you've got the margin, instead of taking the money out of the business, I would think about getting an assistant because, you know, the more that like, instead of expanding your lifestyle, expand your capacity. And the more that you can expand your capacity, now everything just accelerates and the compound interest of a great investment just kicks off on overdrive. Boy, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Tim, you know, this has been an extraordinarily engaging conversation. I love every minute of it, and I, I appreciate you sharing the story. Um, and, but before we, before we go, I want you to get out your crystal ball and tell us uh, about the future. Uh, how do you see, whether it's e-commerce or uh, entrepreneurs in general, or uh, j just the state of the union, as it were, from today, maybe look ahead five years and tell us the types of things you, you see changing in that time period. Thanks for that question. And I'll tell you what, in a sense, we don't even need a crystal ball because the future is here, my friend. Um, you know, 10 years ago, so, so it's, it's, to, to me, it's the intersection of three factors. The first is technology. 10 years ago, we didn't have the fiber optic cable, broadband internet, Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to work virtually the way that we do now. And you know, every Amazon seller knows that, right? So every e-commerce owner owns that. Anyone who's ever worked virtually knows that. 10 years ago, I mean, it was like, there's no way that you and I are having this conversation with smooth audio, smooth video, right? And it was what, 20 years ago that we had to like, with the chirping of modem and dial up, you know what I mean? Don't remind so, me, oh man, I used to have yeah. and uh, 300 baud modems. I could tell you stories, believe me. Right, and, and hopefully no one in the house picked up the phone or else it interrupted oh, the internet, Lord. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, you know, this is the first time, the first time in the history of mankind that we've had technology supporting the ability to, to work from home, us and our team. The second factor that intersects all this is the, the workplace acceptability to work from home. Before it was thought like, ah, oh, no, that must be a scam. Like, no, that's not a real job. Now, like, I mean, I found out a few years ago, literally like the government of Texas has part of its workforce working from home. Like the government is generally a very, very, very slow to change, slow to adopt type environment even they are starting to have some work from home opportunities. Um, and then thirdly is just the appetite. So get this, Steve, we did some research on American workers and we discovered that nine, it was, I can't remember if it was 94, 97% of, of American workers wish they could work from home at least part time. And, and 64 to 67% of all American workers wish they could work from home full time. Hmm. So if we take a look at that, would you say of all the jobs in America, and this, and, and this is going to be similar in Canada or Australia, I mean, pretty much any country, would you say that 64 to 67% of the jobs that are available out there are 100% work from home? Not a chance. <laughs> Not a chance. And yet, you and I, as entrepreneurs of internet businesses, 
have an opportunity. We get to be the pretty girl. You, we get to be the homecoming queen at the 1200 person dance because we have a job that's available that does allow full-time work from home. And, and so because we're at the middle of that for the next, I would say at least five, if not 10 years, we get like incredible, incredible talent that otherwise wouldn't be available for us at this price point. So something I shared at Catalyst 88 is I had this huge aha a handful of years ago. It's similar to that idea that good, fast, cheap, you can only ever have two to three. Like if you ever have a fender bender with your car, if you want it fixed good and you want it to be fast, it ain't coming cheap because they got to pay overtime to the mechanics, right? If you want it to be fast and you want it to be cheap, you got to go to Geno's on the corner and it ain't going to be very good. And if you want it to be good and you want it to be cheap, you're going to have to go to your uncle who's a mechanic. He's going to work it on the evenings and weekends. So it ain't coming very fast, right? And so in hiring, we've got a similar situation. Of course, we would love to have the best talent. We'd like to have really attractive compensation. So like not have to pay too much. And of course, we'd want an employee to be like following us around and like there to be at our beck and call 24 hours a day to do whatever we want to be our concierge, right? Yeah. That, that, that would be like the perfect situation. Now, here's the thing is you can only have two to three. So if you want high caliber talent and if you want them to be working nine to five from your office at your beck and call, that's what's called a traditional day job. And now you're competing with Coca-Cola, Google, IBM, the state of Texas. You're competing with everyone in the open job market. And you're going to have to pay a talented assistant like, I don't know, $35, $40 an hour, if not more, like maybe even more like $75,000 a year, right? If, however, you're willing to be flexible on the working conditions, therefore allowing someone to work from home, maybe some flexible hours, you know, if you can be flexible on that, now you can get amazing talent at an amazing and attractive price point. And so literally of the 160, 170 assistants that we've hired now for clients, we've had project managers from Google. We've had former executive assistants to Fortune 500 companies. We've had former legal assistants. We've had people with like MBAs. Like it is unbelievable the caliber of North American talent you're able to get for 17 to $20 an hour. And, and that wrinkle in the matrix exists right now. I mean, right now. This is not a matter of someday it's going to hit. It is hitting right now. And, and this wrinkle exists for, like I said, maybe five to 10 more years until the rest of corporate America and government America catches up. Well, I really do think, you know, so the, the takeaway there, the future is going to be more competitive for us, right? Yeah. We have an opportunity today. And I, I quite agree with this premise that, you know, we have the chance to pioneer this, to, to kind of reinforce the, and validate this, this concept that, yes, people can, in fact, be productive. And, yes, we can offer flexibility with hours or locations or whatever the case may be. All of this is, is our opportunity to embrace, capture, validate, and then, uh, ideally, you know, we get to leverage that, that uh, benefit uh, for the, that five- to ten-year uh, window, which is, is ample time. So I, I really do agree with that premise that this is a unique time for all of the reasons you mentioned, and that there's no reason in the world that we shouldn't take advantage of, of uh, you know, this extraordinary opportunity. So um, I, I will make sure in the show notes that we include links to greatassistance.com and, and any of those types of things. Um, any final parting words of wisdom you care to leave with the awesomers out there? Yeah, um, so, so first of all, um, you know, I. I really, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, as your fellow entrepreneur, I think that we need to make sure that everything that we do has a positive return on investment. And, and that includes getting an assistant. And if for any reason, getting an assistant is not a positive ROI, then wait, don't get one now. Um, I got my first assistant too soon and it ended up just costing me money and then she quit. And then I was, you know, it was an expensive lesson is what it was. Um, and so I think that there's something about being thoughtful about both the timing of when we get the next, our next assistant and also like, what's the path? Because what doesn't work is hiring an assistant and saying, okay, do your thing, right? That just doesn't work. And a lot of entrepreneurs will hire first and then they'll try to delegate a few things. 
And then the assistant will get good at those few things. And then the assistant will say, okay, what's next? And then the entrepreneur will go, crap. And because they don't have a vision about where that assistant can go next, now all of a sudden we've got an assistant that's not getting any hours. They get disappointed. They quit when they didn't have to end that way. Instead, we just got to flip it the other way around. We got to come up with the vision first of how can this assistant fit into my business? What are like the first five or six areas or tasks that they will tackle first? Then from there, identify here's the deliverables of those tasks, you know, put it into a tool called 360 delegation, which is something that we offer. Um, a lot of the resources I've mentioned are available at profitfactory.com. I'm sorry, uh, greatassistant.com forward slash toolbox. So there's links there that people can click on. Um, and then, uh, and then once we've gone through vision and we've gone through delegate, we use the tool called 360 delegation. Then after that, let's go hire someone. Right. And so, uh, we've got folks in our team that can certainly help, uh, anyone who's interested in going down this road to see if it's the right timing and to also establish if there's an ROI here for, or not. And if there isn't, it's just, just like save yourself the heartache. Don't get an assistant now, go build up some margin first or something like that. And then maybe come back in three to six months. Yeah. I, I think that's very, again, uh, wise advice given there. And, you know, I would just echo Tim's comments that, you know, you can in fact have a positive ROI on, you know, an assistant and, and, and on many of the things, if not all the things that you decide to spend your time and, and resources on in a business. And this is no different. Um, I, what I love is the systemic approach to solving this problem. This is not, you know, instead of you using your dartboard and throwing it against the resume stack and you just switch that over to Tim and he's doing the same resume. I've seen the comprehensive system that they go through. And for anybody who's really you're kind of on the cusp of this question, I would definitely kind of reach out to them, take a look at it and see if now is the right time because the process and the comprehensive nature of the process to, to where you find the matching and you get the, the, the whole thing to fit together, that is truly a systemic approach and something I greatly respect. So uh, kudos to you and the team for building that. Uh, and, and thank you especially for taking the time out to share some of your, your past and, uh, and present with us today, Tim. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been an honor. Well, it's, uh, it's been another exciting episode, everybody, here at awesomers.com, and we will be right back after this. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals, congratulations on your success to date. Your creativity, strategic vision, problem solving, and discipline have allowed you to build your own e-commerce business. Wouldn't it be great if you had more time to focus on the things that truly drive the sales and growth of your company? Instead of getting lost in a dozen different services and countless spreadsheets, what if there was one system that connected to your Amazon account and automatically gave you the information that you needed to make great decisions and really impact your business? Parsimony ERP can do that. Parsimony is the business operating system for your marketplace business. With Parsimony, you get true double entry bookkeeping, easy financial statements, full customer service tools, and item by item profitability, along with project and task management, and more features are being added all the time. Learn more at parsimony.com. That's parsimony, P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y.com. Parsimony.com. We've got that. Well, Tim does not disappoint. Not only did all of you get a personal invite to his Austin dinner parties, which uh, is a pretty cool uh, opportunity. Hashtag didn't expect that. Uh, but you got a lot of knowledge dropped on you today. And Tim is really, I think, living the dream when it comes to helping entrepreneurs and, and doing what he can to kind of uh, push people towards achievement and push people towards uh, improvement. And I think that is a very valuable uh, set of skills. And I know that uh, Tim is somebody that really walks the talk. He doesn't just talk the talk, right? He, he's getting it done. And I'm, I'm personally quite interested in his idea of using his technique to find a great assistant. I think that's a very intriguing thing. And I may, in fact, be a test client for him coming up pretty soon. Now, of course, with nearly 200 of these already in the bag, he certainly doesn't need me, but I'll benefit from all of that wonderful experience that he has. I really appreciate the fact that Tim was willing to share, you know, such uh, the, the high highs and the low lows of his origin story. I always believe that you know, everybody sees kind of the flashy uh, car or house or, you know, hey, look at this guy successful, this gal, she's successful, but they don't really remember or they don't really know the struggles that it took to get there. They don't know, you know, the investment of time and energy and sometimes pain that went along with it. And I want everybody out there to remember that 
you know, no matter where you are, that doesn't matter. No matter where you came from, that doesn't matter. It matters where you're going. And Tim, is his story is inspiring and it's a great example of somebody who was able to, you know, kind of hit that low, low and then come charging back and, and become the craftsman that he dreamed of becoming. And he's, he's still on that journey. You know, he would tell you himself, that's not a journey that will ever end. He's always constantly improving. And again, I find that to be quite inspiring myself and something that I truly respect. So this has been episode number 54 of the Awesomers.com podcast. And all you have to do is pop on over to Awesomers.com slash 54. And you can find all of the show notes and details and even a link or two. And again, as I said earlier, why not go ahead, pop onto our our mailing list there and you'll get some some free processes and and things along the way. Definitely things that I think are, are valuable and Awesomers around there seem to appreciate them. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now is a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you can even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again.